Uh, for this lecture, we have a distinguished guest with us, Dr. Anurab Ghosh, the founder CEO, Council on Energy, Environment and Water. <coughs> he is a public policy expert, author, columnist and of course also an institution builder. Uh, he advises governments, industry, civil society and international organizations on energy, water, climate and of course on economic matters. Uh, he is currently vice chair of the UN committee for development policy. He also serves as the co-convener and commissioner of uh, what is described as our common air a global initiative to accelerate air quality action. Um, he is a member also of the high level consultative group for the US Department of States Energy Transition Accelerator. He has published several important books on uh, these and related subjects. So I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Ghosh and uh, thank him for uh, his presence. Uh, here today. Energy economy uh, and quality of life as uh, we can see are uh, closely related things. Uh, many of us however do not uh, consciously think about the close link. Many of us meaning those who are not experts uh, in either energy or uh, in economy about the close link between economic growth and development on the one hand and uh, sustainability of energy supplies on the other. Um, I would say that energy is one of those things and here I include all forms of energy, renewable, non-renewable, non-conventional, conventional. In the modern times one can say that India has uh, in various phases and because of various reasons suffered from uh, many challenges related to energy. Mm. Now one small instance that I can cite for example is that although we are among the largest uh, uh, producers of coal in the world, the fact is that much of our coal is of low quality. Its ash content is very high and the coking variety coal is not produced in uh, uh, good enough quantities. Now India's uh, electricity production has uh, increased vastly in the last decade or so. But there one challenge I believe and we would like to hear from Dr. Ghosh about this is one challenge is that compared to uh, many other important countries including I believe China, US, the per unit cost of electricity in our country is still too high and that of course has an impact on economic growth and development because it obviously you know, uh, increases the cost of production of everything. But the good thing is that at least the supply side has uh, improved in the last 10-15 years. In the non-renewable, uh, in the renewable energy sector also, there has been a lot of positive development and uh, I'm sure that that has given a boost to economic growth and development in India. However, the fact remains that with a country of the size of India, meaning in terms of population, we are already 1.42 billion and as it is said we have just 2.5% of the total land area of the world and we support roughly 17% of the population of the world. I don't mean to say that there is any uh, you know clear and definitive connection between the you know between the size of land and the number of people. Obviously there are climatic, geographical, historical factors involved in uh, variations of population density of different parts of the world. 
but uh, certainly uh, you know as far as economic development and energy sustainability is concerned there is a relationship what that relationship is probably dr ghosh will uh, go into greater detail about that uh, so this uh, creates one of the biggest challenges now water again you know which is a part of this uh, you know uh, ecosystem again we have uh, you know much less uh, availability of fresh water in india i think maybe 3% or something like that compared to our vast population whereas many countries are blessed with the supply of fresh water us canada roughly have about 10% of the fresh water supply of the world and canada has what you know just about uh, 35 million people and india has uh, 1420 million people so these are some of the you know things and challenges that we have been facing and i believe that energy challenge uh, has been a major factor in sort of uh, uh, restraining probably you know uh, our potential uh, for economic growth especially from the 1970s uh when the prices of oil started going up and now of course uh, because of uh, uh the threatened environmental and climatic change which is happening around the world uh there are many other things which we have to do in order to create uh, sustainable energy supplies and alternatives for our economic development and as our leaders have been saying for the last many decades obviously these choices are very delicate choices for india because we are still despite the great economic development that has happened in the last 30 years in terms of our per capita income in terms of uh, the general levels of development even in infrastructure one can say we still have a long way to go and therefore obviously our focus has been on uh, economic development and producing energy uh, as cheaply as possible so that uh, you know it can help uh, the country develop further but of course this goal of sustainable energy is also very important and all these things i must say of course are related to the quality of life because once this climate change happens it will adversely affect the quality of life of most people but certainly more of the poorer people the marginalized sections and marginalized geographies so uh, with uh, this uh, little introduction i once again uh, welcome dr ghosh and uh, invite him to proceed with his lecture thank you dr mishra and uh, thank you so much to the prime minister's museum and library to invite me here um you have actually laid the context very well uh, where energy is not just a sectoral silo but something that impacts the economy as a whole and impacts the quality of life of citizens uh, so that is really the kind of thread that i will try and connect uh, why should we care about what is happening to energy and climate from the point of view, view of the economy and then also what can the economy do to drive the changes that are coming in our energy system um i don't want to make it a technical conversation about energy systems so please feel if anywhere i stray and i you feel that i am making too many technical remarks please feel free to interrupt me if something is not clear but hopefully i'll conclude with a focus on how all of these come together in terms of what you and me not just as academics as researchers as policy makers policy advisors but as ordinary citizens how it all comes together for our own quality of life as a way of introduction i represent the council on energy environment and water as an institution that i founded in 2010 we will be 14 years old this august uh, our objective is to impact sustainable development at scale with data integrated analysis and strategic outreach um our work has structured around these three pillars as you can see the system level transformations in our economy so we do a lot of long term low carbon economic modeling at the national and at the state level we work a lot on the renewable energy uh, transition that is happening in india um in fact the national solar mission began at the same year as we were founded 
Uh, but we also look at the future of our markets, how uh, how those how the market designs are then going to change the way our digital revolution and our decarbonization revolution comes together. Focus a lot on industrial sustainability, and of course, all of this is linked to livelihoods. But then, ordinary citizens care not so much on the supply side, but on what is their lived experience. What is the air they breathe? the water they drink, what the food they ingest, how we cool ourselves in a hot country, how we move from place to place. These are the day-to-day -day concerns of citizens that we also need to address. To do any of the above, whether it is system level transformation or change the quality of life of ordinary citizens, we need enablers. We need finance, technology, a new focus on circular economy. We need international cooperation. So this is how CEW operates. We have a team, as of today, about 285 people, uh, several hundred peer-reviewed publications, a lot of focus on making data available to the public at large. Uh, we conduct some of the world's largest surveys on various issues. Uh, so that helps with evidence-based policy making. Uh, we, of course, have done research in more than 20 states and right now working uh, with 15 state governments, of course, in addition to several ministries at the central level. So in the last uh, 14 years, we've been ranked repeatedly amongst Asia's leading policy research institutions and among the 20 best climate think tanks in the world. Um, so let me start with how our growing economic might is also sitting side by side by growing with growing climate vulnerability. And Dr. Mishra and I were just discussing a little while earlier, how we both remember when the economic reforms kick-started uh, somewhat in the mid-80s, but formally from the early 1990s, and how that has, of course, changed the economy. But I also want to tell you how that's impacting us environmentally. Uh, so this graphic uh, shows you how our GDP per capita, the gross domestic product per capita, has grown. That's the dark blue line on an upward sloping curve. Uh, in dollar terms, uh, we're close to about $2,400 per capita. Of course, in, in uh, purchasing power parity terms, I don't want to get into the technical stuff, uh, it is uh, higher. And the lighter blue curve is the economic growth rate. Uh, so in 1991, that growth rate fell to just 1%. Uh, then it jumped up over the last two and a half decades, it has gone up and down. Of course, during the pandemic, it collapsed severely. But broadly, we are at now at about 6-7%, closer to 7%. If we want to really become developed, we should be aiming for about 9 or 10% growth rate per annum if we want to become a developed economy by 2047. Uh, now, this rapid growth in the economy has resulted in the fact that we are now the fifth largest economy in the world by GDP, by current GDP, and fourth largest by purchasing power parity. Um, so that's the United States' largest economy by current GDP, China second largest, but by PPP terms it is now larger than all of the European Union, so let's leave that aside, Japan, Germany, and then India. But we expect by 2030, will be the third largest economy, if not sooner. So that is the broader economic might that India is enjoying. Of course, alongside this will need to be, those dots are the growth rates, and you can see we have some of the highest, maybe Turkey or Saudi Arabia, have, uh, Saudi Arabia has a higher growth rate, but really amongst major non-oil producing economies, we are the largest, fastest growing major economy in the world. All this is good news. And yet we are highly vulnerable to a changing climate. Um, so at CEW, we've been developing the first high-resolution climate risk atlas in India and sort of the first of its kind in the developing world. What does high-resolution climate risk atlas mean? It basically means that for an economy that is, you know, $4 trillion large, 1.4 billion people, seventh largest in terms of landmass, 
there's no point saying we are climate vulnerable. What matters is Delhi climate vulnerable versus Rohtak climate vulnerable versus Pondicherry climate vulnerable and how so. Because the economic activities in these regions will vary. If you're a farming community or a farming district, how heat stress impacts your wheat output will be very different from if you were an industrialized district where maybe water stress reduces the water available to run your factories. Um, both will have economic impact, but climate change has a different implication for you. Which is why we have to get to a district level and then a sub-district level analysis, which is what we've been doing. So what we can see is that 5 out of 20 Indians are highly vulnerable to floods, droughts and cyclones. But 80% of Indians are living in areas that are already vulnerable to one or the other type of climate shock. In fact, what we see here is that 40% of our districts are showing swapping trends, meaning that what was traditionally a flood prone district is now becoming more drought prone. What is traditionally a drought prone is becoming flood prone. Which means again, how you deal with these shocks to your agriculture, to your industry, to data centers, to transport systems, etc. All depends on being able to understand these risks better. Um, since 1970, over the last 50 years, we see that there has been 12-fold increase in associated cyclonic events, 20-fold increase in the number of flooding events that we are impacted by. Uh, so these are no longer just natural disasters. Uh, these have direct economic consequence running into tens of billions of dollars. Globally, uh, in 2022, the latest data we have, there were 250 billion dollars of damages due to extreme weather events. But only 125 billion dollars was insured. Bulk of the infrastructure in the developing countries was not insured against these types of extreme events. So the next time we are celebrating the inauguration of a big bridge in India, or a big power station, or a big expressway, we have to also think, is this capital investment going to be resilient against climate risk? Not because it's just an environmental issue, it has a direct impact on the economic losses for such capital in investment. So, if we have one of the world's fastest growing economies, and yet are also one most vulnerable, how do we square that kind of a challenge with the other developmental imperatives, whether it's poverty reduction or hunger or, or inequality, etc. Pick your SDG. I'm going to focus on energy and water as a way of example. But first, let me show you, and this is, I think, something that Dr. Mishra was also referring to earlier. Uh, there is no example of getting to a high level of human development without a fair increase in uh, energy usage. Uh, today, India's per capita energy consumption, per, per capita electricity consumption is maybe about 1,300 units a year. The average for the world is about 3,500 units a year. For the United States, it might be closer to 15,000, 16,000 units a year. For Japan, it might be closer to 10,000 units a year. So we cannot aspire to be a developed country if we don't also simultaneously increase access to energy, not just to light up a bulb, but to make sure a small factory can run, to make sure irrigation pumps can run, to ensure that our metro systems can run, etc. So energy is a critical need for high human development. But it is also a choice whether we use that energy efficiently, like Japan does to an extent, or we use the energy inefficiently, like in the United States. So you can get to high developed country status without having excessive use of energy, but it certainly has to be much more than where we are. So let me give you two examples of how India has rapidly increased access to energy in the last uh, two decades, and particularly in the last decade. Uh, on the left side panel, you see cooking fuel. So in the census of 2011, the average for India was that only 29% of households were using LPG cylinders as their primary cooking fuel. 
Uh, why this matters from the economy perspective is not just what is the fuel. It is also, if you were not using LPG, or you were not using, say, an electric cook stove, then you're using cow dung, firewood, twigs, leaves, etc. Collecting all of that is a laborious exercise. It means, and often that burden is falling on women in the household, which means keeping them away from a more productive activity that they could be earning income for themselves and their homes. It is also highly polluting to be using solid fuels inside closed confined spaces. I will tell you later how it's one of the biggest sources of air pollution that we encounter. So it is an economic impact, it has a pollution impact. So as a result, uh, we see that over time, especially with the push of the Ujwala scheme, we see a massive increase in the connections to LPG cylinders. So now for urban India, that jumped up from 65% to 95%. And these numbers, the IRES 2020 is our own survey, the India Residential Energy Survey, the largest of its kind in the world. Uh, for rural India, it has crossed 61%. Overall India, about 71%. But this is just connection to an LPG cylinder. That doesn't mean every day you're using the LPG cylinder. That doesn't mean end of the month you're always topping it up. So we still have a long way to go to make sure that these cleaner cooking fuels is the primary fuel of choice. But it shows you also how quickly that transformation can be brought about. Another example from the electricity side. In 2015, when the SDGs were announced, I'm assuming you all know what is the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, we had the dubious distinction of having the largest number of people with a, without access to any electricity in the world. So, what happened in, 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 in 2015, same month as the SDGs were announced, we brought out the results from the largest survey on energy access. And we showed how in different districts, different villages, different hamlets, where there was connection, where there was not connection, and so forth. And in 2017 then, a scheme was launched called Sobhagya, which was basically that we go beyond village electrification to household level electrification. And you can see from the curves, again, the green lines are urban and rural, and the gray line is the India average. We have now reached over 97% of all households in the country at least having a wire coming in and there's a light bulb. Basically in 18 months, 28 million homes, so close to about 130 million people got access to electricity. But over the last two decades, about 800 million Indians have got access to electricity. Now this is, these are both good signs of development progress. Of course, we need to make sure, as I was saying, that the homes can afford that energy to keep the lights on, to keep the, to fill up their cylinders. Just to put this in perspective, that it that period of October, about from October 2017 to 18 months of the Sobhagya scheme, we electrified about 11,000 people per hour. The rest of the world needs to electrify another 11 and a half thousand people per hour up to 2030, every hour, in order to cover for the remaining 700 million people in the world that don't have access to electricity. So it gives you a sense of perspective how big this transformation is and how uh, it is important not to take what we have for granted. In my own team, we had a senior member join uh, a few months ago their own village got electricity for the first time in 2014. And this is someone who themselves have a PhD and has joined CW, etc. So this is not some far off grandmother's tale that of not having energy. These are all very lived experiences. And it's important to understand these revolutions that are undertaking uh, in India. In water, we are a little behind the curve, but things are progressing. Again, access to safe water means it's accessible, uh, that it is clean, it is free from contamination, and it is available when it is needed. Um, I myself live in a neighborhood uh, which is reasonably affluent, and yet water will only come 
at a few hours in the morning and a few hours in the evening perhaps not even that so you have to time your pump so this is again our lived experience the quality of life of citizens that we have to understand um so census of 2011 27% of households had access to improved water source within their premises that jumped up to 56% 35% of rural households had that has jumped up to 58% improved water sources 71% of rural households in 2011 jumped up to 95% but of course this is the source of this this is uh, census of india's 2011 and nss round NSS. yeah in 2018 but now there is this har ghar jal so we are now evaluating that there is also the atal bhujal yojana so how is ground water uh, getting impacted etc but just as i said about energy we need to make sure that these basic requirements of development are met without that girls are not going to go to school uh, women are not going to be freed up from laborious tasks that can enable them to participate more productively in the economy uh, men might be leaving agriculturally distressed districts as out migrants so these are direct economic impacts in how we are thinking about our trajectory over the next half uh, quarter century as we move towards developed country status so now if you understand the two first messages i've given you that we are a fast growing economy that's highly vulnerable we still have a lot of progress that we made and still need to make on development priorities how does this come together when we think about climate action at home so let me start by illustrating that we have not one but many energy transitions by my count four energy transitions that is going on in parallel the first is something that i've already hinted at the move from not having energy at all or modern energy to moving towards modern energy that's the swabhagya scheme for electricity or the ujwala scheme for cooking fuel access the other thing that's happening is that we are also an urbanizing society urban india today is already the third largest country by population to that urban india we will be adding another about 600 million people what does that mean from an economy and an energy term from economy term means we have to build hundreds if not thousands more cities uh that is going to be an infrastructure opportunity perhaps also yield higher productivity from our labor force but from energy perspective it will mean that you're not looking just at energy to run water pumps in fields but energy to run a building like this run our transport systems run our shopping malls etc so the energy pattern changes both in rural india and in urban india uh whether it's in we have the world's largest solar irrigation program i'll talk a lot about decentralized energy for livelihoods in a bit how e mobility can ch- change our transport systems all of this is then linked to making sure growth is sustainable so again i will talk in more detail how we have become the fourth largest renewable energy market in the world how we have big targets for green hydrogen how we have this big push on efficient light bulbs and super efficient appliances uh let's take ceiling fan something as basic as a ceiling fan summer is coming i'm sure all of us are starting to run our fans you would think what has this got to do with energy and the and and the economy 90% of indian households have access to a fan but only 3% of those fans are efficient means every time we are running the fan you are losing money every time we are running the fan our energy system is losing energy if we shifted all our fans to super efficient fans just like we shifted our bulbs to super efficient led bulbs that market alone is 20 billion dollars 20 billion dollars just selling super efficient fans now who wants to sell a start a fan business i live in a rented house and despite all the fans belong to the landlord i am choosing to change my fans to super efficient fans because over time i'm going to make i'm going to save money on my electricity bills so an individual consumption choice impacts my individual household disposable income also impacts the energy system as a whole 
but it creates a whole new market that doesn't exist. Today, we have only $1 billion of sales of super efficient fans. The 20x change in just one market, that's possible. So as our energy system grows rapidly, we get into deeper and deeper integration to global energy markets and choices we make. I don't want to get into the details about LNG and etc. But what I want to say is our energy choices will then shape how energy prices move globally. Very different from 50 years ago when the oil shock first happened, impacted all developed countries, but also impacted us. We are now going to be, in a way, the shapers of global energy markets. So this will be the shape, or we expect, of our energy system. Uh, we are currently highly reliant on fossil fuels. Bulk of that is oil, gas, coal. It's all the light orange, orange parts. Right? And that will keep growing because we are a fast-growing economy. But we expect that the fossil fuels use will peak around 2040. And then it will come down to what is called net zero. Meanwhile, the other sources, biomass, nuclear, hydrogen, wind, solar, etc., you can see how they will, they are already growing shares of the energy system, and you'll see how they will come to dominate our energy system. So the energy system you and I, and even our grandparents have grown up with, will look very different from what we are going to build out over the next few decades. Uh, so let me illustrate that a little bit with some of the announcements India has made. Uh, this is called the Panchamrit that Prime Minister Modi announced in Glasgow in 2021. Our objective is to reduce, first of all, emissions intensity of GDP. It means for every extra dollar of GDP we grow, we emit less of greenhouse gases. Then by 2030, we want to have 50% of our electric power capacity coming from non-fossil sources. Already we have reached 44%. We want 500 gigawatts of non-fossil capacity. We are at 191 gigawatts now. Remember, in 2010, we had only 20 gigawatts, or 20 megawatts of solar. One gigawatt is 1,000 megawatts. We now have 190,000 megawatts or 190 gigawatts, which will grow to 500 gigawatts. Right. Then we want to become net zero, means no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2070. This is not just an energy system story. It's that water you're drinking will have to become net zero because the cooler from where it was pumped has to run on zero energy, zero, zero emitting energy. The shirt you're wearing has to come from an agricultural system that will be net zero. Uh, the screen will have to use almost no emitting, uh, no greenhouse gas emitting energy. Right? So every, it's an economic transformation that we'll be going through while we also go through a supply, a demand side change in our lifestyles. Let me illustrate that quickly and run through a few slides a little faster. Um, this graphic shows you how our renewable energy growth has happened. The light bars are solar, dark bars are wind. As I was saying, in 2010, less than 20 megawatts of solar. 2012, about 2 gigawatts. We now have over 70 gigawatts of solar, over 40 gigawatts uh, of wind. And then you have this growth rate, rapid growth rate that's happening in, in renewables. So we have already become the fourth largest renewable energy market in the world in wind and in solar. Uh, let's take mobility. First, let me show you some uh, numbers of how we move. I came here in a hybrid car. Okay, so most of the time that my car is driving, it's driving on a battery. Um, but I am one of the very privileged Indians who happens to drive in a car. We did the country's largest survey of urban mobility. More than 60% of urban Indians, their primary mode of transport is their two legs. So again, we are in a very slim segment of society that we even have access to motorized transport. But growing up, I had no access to motorized transport. Uh, so again, it is the lived reality of, of citizens and their quality of life that we have to focus on. But linked to that is a macroeconomic story. The below 
graphic comes from our EV dashboard. We have real-time data week by week of number of EVs being sold in the country. Ten years ago in 2014, 2,400 EVs sold. This financial year, still five more days to go, 1.6 million EVs sold already. Again, a market that didn't exist. Right. But bulk of these will come as public transport or two-wheelers and three-wheelers. It's not about selling Teslas in India. It is about making sure that those 60% Indians, like me, who went to college walking, like the 60% Indians who are doing that even now, they have access to trans public transport, but which is also clean. Okay. Uh, the renewables market that I showed you earlier gives us an opportunity of investment of $200 billion this decade. This EV market this decade, $206 billion of expected sales. And then comes green hydrogen. What is green hydrogen? You take water, put it through an electrolyzer, you split it into water and oxygen, hydrogen and oxygen. That hydrogen becomes an industrial fuel. But to make that water, hydrogen, it requires a lot of energy. Green hydrogen means you're splitting that water using clean energy. India has, after the United States and all of the European Union, the second largest target in the world for green hydrogen, 5 million tons per annum. This alone, second highest country, we could deliver about 20% of our energy from green hydrogen. Currently, it's almost zero helping to decarbonize industries like steel, fertilizer, etc. This alone is another $140 billion of potential investment this decade alone. Now you're getting a sense of how this is not just an environmental silo or an energy silo. This is now, I've articulated to you, a more than $500 billion of investment opportunity this decade from just three sectors, renewables, mobility, and hydrogen. While we are doing all of this, we are also taking the story out to the world. So we have created something called the International Solar Alliance. India and France created this jointly, announced it in 2015, came into force in 2018. Now 119 member countries. First international organization headquartered in India, looking at a range of different applications of clean energy across these member countries. We are also trying to make ourselves more resilient. Remember, I fo focused on climate vulnerability. So India has created a coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure, looking at telecoms, transport, finance, power, urban. Again, what I said, how these disasters impact economic sectors of the economy. And then we had the G20 presidency last year, in which eight out of 29 pages of the leader's declaration came out in the form of what is called the Green Development Pact, or GDP where we focused on sustainability, from lifestyles to circular economy, to development, principles on hydrogen, principles on minerals, and so forth, and then focused on multilateralism to drive this forward. Uh, so if we are there, or if so many things are happening, and I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you, but what broadly I'm highlighting is in this fast-growing but vulnerable economy, we have climate action at home, which is linked to those development priorities of energy access, but also clean energy. And we have climate action happening abroad as well. But certain vulnerabilities remain. And I want to bring back, in the last 10 minutes of my lecture, bring that back to how do we solve for those vulnerabilities at the economy level, and how do we solve for those vulnerabilities at a citizen level. First, let's start with the vulnerability of finance. I suggested to you that there are, there's over $500 billion of investment that we could be getting. But right now, the about $40, $50 billion that's coming into India for climate finance, bulk of it, 90% is going to what is called mitigation activities. Those are then linked to energy efficiency, clean transport, and so forth. Adaptation activities, dealing with floods, droughts, cyclones, 
just 10 percent of the financing we now need to make sure that the financing total quantum of finance increases but also that we are investing in resilience and adaptation as well to deal with those vulnerabilities that we are facing the other vulnerability and dr mishra referred to this earlier that 50 years ago when we had an energy shock we were worried about how you get oil so let's look at the right side panel we get our fossil fuels from a range of countries iraq saudi arabia uae us nigeria kuwait etc so we've tried to diversify now if i if you accept my premise that the future energy system will be much cleaner we'll have a lot more renewables in the market which is good but are we getting over dependent on just a few just china plus hong kong accounts for 92% of all our clean clean energy product imports so we have to clean up the energy system while not being vulnerable like we were with oil and gas these just show you how the number of countries have that are more and more dependent on just a few sources of clean energy products whether it's wind energy gensets solar pv panels or lithium ion batteries has gone up so as the world is decarbonizing the dependence is also increasing and we have to find solutions for widening that energy supply story so that we have access to these products from various countries not just a few including manufacturing some at home that then creates an economic opportunity for us similarly critical minerals this phone has critical minerals in it a solar panel has critical minerals in it this computer has critical minerals in it our semiconductors have critical minerals in it right now just 15 countries are home to 55% of identified critical minerals for the energy transition and even fewer of them account for 70% of the production of these minerals if you don't have cobalt if you don't have graphite if you don't have copper if you don't have lithium if you don't have rare earths this whole electronics revolution digital revolution decarbonization revolution will not happen but this has sociological implications as well if we were digging up mines at home what would that mean for communities that are in those regions if we are digging up mines elsewhere how are we establishing trading suppliers that ensures those minerals come to us without supply disruptions so that's one type of vulnerability the second way to deal with vulnerabilities is bringing the energy transition closer to people uh let me give you an example i told you earlier that if we have 800 million people that we electrified over two decades the world still has about 700 million people that still needs to be electrified but in 2019 150 million people across the world got access to electricity through dre distributed renewable energy solutions now look at these pictures and these are all from india that's a solar based food dryer on top solar based irrigation pump solar based loom solar charkha solar based hydroponics to grow cattle fodder solar based refrigerators we have been supporting a bunch of startups uh and in just two and a half years these startups enabled 19000 plus nearly 20000 clean energy powered livelihoods 69% of the micro entrepreneurs who were created as a result of the program of women more than 12000 technologies of these kinds were deployed these startups had over a doubling of their annual revenue they then unlocked millions of dollars of follow up capital india has become the first country this is just cw and will grows program but based on this experience india has become the first country with a policy framework to support distributed renewables for livelihoods why do i say this you mentioned coal earlier today 200 of our districts are dependent on at least one coal based assets uh including formal and informal labor about 20 million people are employed in this sector but using clean energy for livelihoods can create 37 million jobs so the energy transition also has to focus on the jobs component and can we then diversify 
rather than just coal concentrated districts, can we diversify this energy revolution in a way that not only is the energy cleaner, the economic opportunity is bigger, the total opportunity is $50 billion in the market today. And that tens of millions of jobs can be created. That is the new mantra that we will have to pursue. Let me give you another example. What do you think is happening here? This is how brass is made. Today if you go to cottage industries, buy a brass gift for somebody, it looks very pretty. But this is how in tiny MSMEs, this picture is from Moradabad, one of the brass capitals of the world. But all this brass is made, it melts at 1200 degrees Celsius. And it is melted using coal. So my colleagues developed an alternative furnace with this brass cluster using cooking gas. And for the first time in India, we managed to melt brass at 1200 degrees Celsius without coal. 55% lower emissions, a cleaner working area. Why do I highlight these two examples of clean energy powered rural enterprises and clean energy powered urban enterprises? Because MSMEs account for 40% of our industrial backbone, 45% of our exports. Unless the energy transition goes out of the energy vertical into the livelihoods of millions of people, either in small town India or in small villages, we will not be able to make that connection. This big transformation that's happening in our energy system, world's fourth largest renewable energy market, also means something for the tens of millions of people who are vulnerable, but for whom the clean energy revolution also opens up new opportunities. Let me then come back, end this lecture with something we all feel, and that is the air we breathe. Just last week, again, the news came out that we are, the dirt, we are living in the dirtiest capital city in the world. The statement I want to put forward to you is rather than think of air pollution as an environmental problem, which it is, how about we think of clean air as an economic asset? Over the last 20 years, India's population has increased 28%. India's GDP has increased 457%. Hence, per capita income is rising. All that is good news story. But the concentrations of PM 2.5, the really, really tiny particulate matter that we ingest in our lungs, has also increased 17%. This has an economic impact. CII produced a report that says 3% of India's GDP, 7 lakh crore is Indian businesses are losing every year because of air pollution, primarily linked to worker productivity. But air pollution also results in lower agricultural productivity. 17% uh, of our national disease burden is due to air pollution. That savings we could be investing in building roads, infrastructure, etc. 8 to 10 percent reduction in productivity of employees. Even our clean energy story gets impacted because when it is hazy, the solar panels are less efficient. So whether you're looking at energy, whether you're looking at industry, whether you're looking at agriculture, whether you're looking at the household, air pollution is an economic problem, not just an environmental afterthought. What is polluting our air? So at CW, when we looked at various different models, we see on average, it is the residential sector. Again, unclean cooking fuel followed by industrial and power sectors. But it means different things. In Delhi, up to 39% of our air pollution is coming from vehicles, transport. Central and western states, primary air pollution is coming from coal-fired thermal power plants. In northeastern states, it's waste burning. Northwestern states, agricultural burning. But this is, we solved the pandemic in 18 to 24 months. It used to take three years 
for any drug to go through clinical trials. When we recognized the crisis, we stepped up and we solved the pandemic in about two years, delivered more than a billion doses of the vaccine. This is a solvable problem as well. If we followed an incisive approach, what is polluting the air? Where? Understand it's an economic asset. Because when I clean up the air, my industrial productivity goes up. Agricultural productivity goes up. Employer, employee productivity goes up. Public health savings happen. Educational outcomes improves. So in order to do that, we first need to monitor properly. Only 6 to 8 percent of the minimum recommended monitoring systems exist. And that is why we are all confused as citizens. As what is called, even in Delhi, so many of us say, oh yeah, must be the Punjab farmers burning. That is accounting for just 5 to 6 percent of the problem when you analyze it over the year. Real problem is if you were monitoring our emissions within the city. Uh, and therefore, we have to have an approach that focuses on better monitoring, better use of data for decision making, better transition to cleaner energy systems, empowering citizens. But we are also working with a group of experts across the world on how do we catalyze collective action for clean air just as the way we are catalyzing collective action for climate change through an economic basis of action, for more access to financing, more access to technologies, and so forth. But this is a solvable problem. So, as I close this out, let me leave you with your key takeaways. India's economic growth is under threat due to its climate vulnerability. The two are not separate, they are linked. We have to get our basics of development right. We have to make sure people have access to electricity, cooking energy, water. But we also have to recognize this has to get cleaner. Hence, recognize the four transitions we are going through simultaneously. Our climate action is not just linked to climate negotiations. It is an economy-wide approach. And that story we are taking out to the rest of the world through our international climate work. But the best way to truly revolutionize this is to bring the energy transition closer to people, to small industries, and to citizens like you and me. Climate action can lead to clean air. Clean air can lead to climate action. Both can grow rather than slow down our economy. That is the message I have for you today. Thank you. So I take this opportunity to once again thank Dr. Arunab Ghosh for accepting our invitation and uh, I also thank all members of the audience for their presence and participation. And let's uh, join for tea.